Hello there. Um, I'm back again with a, another uh, another little preview of what's going to be coming out in, in, in my book in December. Um, again, uh, let me say I'm you know really grateful to anybody who's who said anything kind uh, about me or the book, and a lot of people have been saying that lately, things like that lately. So uh, I am very grateful uh, to you all for that. Um, it means a great deal. Uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to a talk I gave uh, uh, on online. Uh, it's over. On, I, I've posted it, a link to it over on my my blog. That's a last not me at blogspot.com. Uh, if you don't know that already, and uh, it is. But they asked me to talk for uh, you know 15, 20 minutes on. Uh, on uh, pity in talking, and so I, I, I was luckily, I was fortunately able able to do that. So uh, uh, if you're interested, there it is. Uh, it's a more focused talk than any, you know than, than anything I'm going to be able to do right here, right now, without delaying you too long. So what I want to give you a sample of uh, today is uh, chapter one. Uh, last time we did the introduction, I'm going to go back to the introduction just briefly because. Uh, in the introduction, uh, I do uh, give a, a detailed uh, summary of of the book chapter by chapter, and just a little bit of a uh, an overview before I get into a couple of specific pages. So, just a little bit more from the introduction here. This is from a section of the introduction called Frodo's Journey and Ours. Tolkien read Beowulf. Tom Shippey tells us, not like a literary critic but like a philologist. His insights tended to be drawn from tiny details, very often very technical ones." Unquote. He created his legendarium in much the same way, through the accumulation of tiny, often technical details of language and story that allowed insight not only to his later readers, himself included, but also to himself as he wrote. Since Tolkien's and Frodo's understandings of many of the elements I have sketched in the previous sections walk in parallel along the road to Mordor and back again, so must ours. Close reading of the text is essential for explicating the nature and role of pity and the ring as it is for perceiving the details which enable us to describe them. I shall thus proceed through the Hobbit's journey with the ring from Bilbo's discovery of it to the departure of Frodo and Bilbo across the sea, before considering the wider implications of the elements of pity and power as exemplified in the ring for the legendarian overall. Chapter 1 establishes the crucial part played in the transformation of Bilbo's magic ring into the One Ring by the lies he told about how he came by it signaling that the ring's power affects the character of its bearer immediately, and that deception of self and others is a key element of that power. The evidence for questioning the assumed consciousness of the ring leads to a more complex port moral portrayal of both Bilbo and Frodo. The paradox presented by pity weighs against the ambiguity surrounding the nature of the ring. Okay, so that from the introduction. Um, and in chapter one, excuse me a second, um, I say the following. Middle Earth is a world that is alive in a mythic sense. Foxes think. The trees of the old forest are aware. The stones of Holland remember. Caradhras is cruel. Birds and beasts have languages that a wizard or ranger might know. And Goldberry, the daughter of the river, can rise from her bed to take a husband. Some, but not all, of these may be metaphors. In a world so imagined, in which there is more to be perceived than mortal minds can dream of, realms both seen and unseen, a world that exists only in a mythical past. It should not be unexpected that we cannot say for sure whether the ring left Gollum means that what it literally says, 
or whether it is a metaphor to describe how it inexplicably fell out of his pocket. The approach to the myth Tolkien takes in the Beowulf essay is instructive for thinking about the ring and the power of its effects. If we probe myth too far and too analytically, like a scientist rather than a poet, we shall miss something critical that must instead be felt and spoken of in metaphors, even if they are scientific metaphors. We shall kill the myth by, quote, vivisection, unquote, a brutal image that evokes a murderous and controversial practice and demonstrates Tolkien's attitude about the care one must take in speaking about and understanding myth. And echoed in uh, and uh, an approach echoed, or excuse me, an attitude echoed in Gandalf's words to Saruman about the folly of breaking something in order to understand it. On this showing, Tolkien seems unlikely to have undertaken so detailed an analysis of the properties of the ring. The truth of the ring needed magic and myth, parable and metaphor, not an exacting inquiry into the arts of the enemy. Such an analysis would lessen the ring, just as Saruman's coat of many colors lessens him, gaining nothing but Gandalf's mockery. Thus, we shall best learn about the ring and its effects gradually, through the slow unfolding of the portraits of Frodo and Gollum in particular, both before and after they meet. Their roads to each other are as, imp as important as their road with each other, and we shall learn as much about them along the way as we do about the ring, for it reveals their character just as much as its character is revealed by them. And together, the ring's great power and the small hands that would bear or wield it change everything, as Elrond nomically observes. Yet it is with Bilbo's lie and with the revelation of that lie that this road begins. Whether as readers we first encountered Bilbo in an unexpected party or a long expected party, the portrayal of him we meet in the first chapter of The Lord of the Rings has to stand on its own merits. Not all readers come to The Lord of the Rings through The Hobbit. Many, like me, read the later work first, and having experienced its more su mature subject and high romantic storytelling, we find ourselves in that moment too old, I'm younger than that now, to appreciate this story, written by Tolkien for his children, for what it is. Even with riddles in the dark rewritten to reflect the transformation of the ring found by Bilbo into something darker, The Hobbit remains a children's book, however excellent. Its importance within the legendarium is as a significant precursor to The Lord of the Rings. For although Tolkien could have easily left The Hobbit as it was in 1937 and still represented the story Bilbo told as a lie, he did not. This decision speaks more than a donnish cleverness that he and the other inklings would have laughed about in Lewis's rooms of a Thursday evening. Rather, by rewriting the earlier work to match the later one, he indicated which he considered the primary text and evinced his, and evinced his desire for a more meaningful intertextuality. For these reasons, we will take the Bilbo of a long expected party first and leave aside the Bilbo of the Hobbit. Okay. That's about enough for now, I'd say. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and uh, I'll be back next week, week after that, like that, with something like that, with, with another chapter, trying to make sure you don't get too sick of me. Uh, the book is due out in, in December, uh, and uh, you know, um, I'm looking forward to it as much as, uh, as, much as anybody. So. Uh, thanks. Take care now. Bye-bye.